I'm actually going to start with a bit of a drawing. I often don't draw an awful lot with a with a pencil. And again, it depends. It depends. So it's unfair to say that I don't do that. Still looking for the Z that I was thinking about earlier. And so what do you... this Z composition, you see that? Right. And that'll help keep the viewer in, in the painting. You get to walk in and it also helps you keep your horizon plane fairly flat. Right. With, th with this curve in the beach, it's so dangerous, it's almost like everything can go uphill very easily, which makes your painting go downhill just as quickly. Can you say a little bit about that Z and the plane, the keeping the plane flat? Because I think a lot of students really well, the, struggle the with that issue. The horizontal plane, when you think about the water, what's happening right at our feet is the same place out in the middle of the ocean. That water, you know, yes, the tide might affect it going up and down, but the uh, uh, the height of the water going up and down, but the fact is that water is level throughout from here, certainly in this part of New England to the uh, to the to that far shore. So uh, it's important to remember, and so in trying to keep that that horizontal flat, it's a very difficult thing, especially with that curved beach. So often a, a student will have that beach oh, as if it's going straight up in the air, or a path, or the railroad tracks, anything like that that recedes keeping that horizontal plane. So thinking in Z's help you keep everything fairly flat. That's a great tip for people, I think, always to be aware of, because that's what makes paintings look so flattened out and one dimensional is that people don't think about how the water is a flat plane. Exactly. And, and everything, everything leads to that. I mean, it's not as if, it's not as if we're, we're, you have to reinvent that every time you do it, but there's, there's that sense. If you get lost, you're painting a boat on the water, and you get lost as to what's happening, just draw a Z through the water, and that'll tell you right away whether, whether it's going uphill or downhill and, and how, you can, how you can get in there and control that a little bit. Right. So, Howard, how are you thinking about your composition here with this scene? Well, I always, always, as, as we both do, always find my thirds. No matter what your format is, if you divide your canvas into these thirds, the eye naturally wants to work in a counterclockwise direction, and the eye naturally wants to rise. That's what the human eye does. So, if you have these four places where those thirds intersect, that's almost a good place to put some point of interest, something so that the human eye will go there. They feel It feels comfortable within the format when it does that. So um, don't do all four of them, of course, right? I mean, that, we've seen mm -hmm. that too, and then you're, right. you're, everything so, becomes so, so busy and, and overdone that, that your viewer just gets, gets overcome with it and, and really doesn't, doesn't want to deal with it, doesn't want to deal with your painting. Right. And so the rule of thirds is really trying to put your points of interest at these points on the painting. And it's not a rigid rule. It doesn't mean you have to rigidly apply it every time, but it's sort of a guideline. Correct. This main conifer is our point of interest, this largest one here that That's we're, gonna, right. that that, we're that putting up. That whole bunch, I'm, gonna, I'm really going to work at trying to keep that. Right. And so the, and the process of our drawing with watercolor and oil is different because you know you're going to go in and do a block in correct for your drawing i know that i have to have my drawing well worked out that's because i'm not going to be going in and altering it once i start putting in the watercolors that's correct and that's a big difference really between the two of us otherwise there's a lot of similarities in what we're doing right in how we're thinking about composition uh and color and today's a real challenging day and we spent some time out here earlier <laughs> when we first arrived at Knox Preserve and it was sunnier and the fog had burned off and the scene looked really different about half an hour ago. And so we've had to, you know, we're contending with very restricted range of kind of colors and values right now. Right, the colors almost, almost non-existent. I mean, there's some warms and cools out there, right? So we do see the grasses that come a bit, especially when they get close up, they get a bit orange. But when the sun was out, the seaweed had that wonderful uh, mustard color to it, and, and the conifers were still were very green. They were lovely greens. That, that... Exactly. So we're, you know, we're, we're kind of working 
we're going to have to work with what we have here, and it's really beautiful here, but it's a, it's a damp um, fog rolling in, which of course is making my paper, it's kind of buckling, because the watercolor paper is just obviously absorbent, and so it's going to absorb the moisture in the air, and it's absor I can feel it, it's, you can see it's kind of buckling, um, and my paints will be affected by it. Absolutely. As well. So. So are you, are you then therefore going to use less water in your with your pigments? Or are you going to probably gonna try to stay with that? Uh... I will. I will probably use less water. But to be honest, there's going to be a little bit of experimentation mm -hmm. <laughs> to see what happens as I as I lay it down. It can end up getting very wet into wet and runny and messy, and so I'm going to need to probably amp up the pigment well experimentation um, every painting really in a way is an experiment it's a learning experience and you should you should you should embrace that right? exactly that's, that's really what has to happen and so with that being said I'm I'm looking now to put in some some of some I'm actually putting a little white in my block and which is a real no-no you don't want to do that but I, I'm actually doing that to find some of these grays some sense that there's some grays here for these for these background trees, these gray greens for the conifers that are out there. And that will help them and help me remember that what they are and what's going on. Right. And then to the far right, what had happened earlier was very gray. Uh, for the the fog was actually coming in from the from the right side even though the wind is coming from our left, that fog came in to the right side of the painting and all that background became very grayed out. Right. So I'm doing that now. And using white in a block in is really, it just makes it difficult to cover properly. But So what should students do in well, that often situation? You just, you, often what you do is you wipe out, right? That's most block ins that you do. You, you wipe out to find the value difference mm -hmm. but in this case as i say in this case i'm doing it just a little differently so here again like you said about your paper it's an experimentation you you you, you try to see what what it is you're going to be able to come up with that's going to give you a pleasing image exactly and there is going to be a little trial and error and you know when you're outside in this kind of condition you maybe don't have as much time to deal with that trial and error, but it also lends a fre real freshness to it when you're plein air painting. Well, that's right. The, the, I like it when 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 you do something rapidly, you're not you're not angsting over it quite as much, and you're not fussing with it quite as much, and therefore you 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 kind of shooting from the hip, if you want. Exactly. And I think that the other thing that is a challenge painting with changing weather conditions like we are is that we did our value sketches and, and even the scene has changed from when we did our value sketches. Absolutely. And so that does create a challenge. How much do you, do you try to approximate what's happening now versus how much are you trying to do what was happening 20 minutes ago? Right. So as a plein air painter, you're making that decision. Um, and that is why the value sketch is so important because it allows you to kind of stay true to well, what was happening. That's true. Although today we might find ourselves uh, deviating from that only because we might see something at some point that's very exciting for us that really uh, uh, makes that painting more interesting and therefore we go with it. Right. Uh, that The value sketch is paramount to stick to your value sketch when you have a moving sun. Here, yes, the sun is still moving, it hasn't stopped, the earth is still turning around, but it's less pronounced with what we're doing. Whereas if you're chasing your shadows and your sun around, that's where you run into trouble with your painting. And so we're both kind of stepping back to see how, what we think about our sketches. Are they, are they what we're looking for? It helps to step back from your painting because it really does, it changes your perspective on what you're doing because you can get very wrapped up in, you know, the details of what's happening and sort of lose sight. So it, it step back every 10 minutes or so, you know, and just kind of see where you are.
If you're a little and lost in that, you're a little lost in your painting. Yeah. And if you step back, you can look at what the other artist is doing and copy theirs, right? Right. Well, it kind of saves you from <laughs> making a big mess. Well, and you're learning from the other people you're painting with, you know, and you're, you, you get ideas from them. And that is the beauty of painting with a group. Or That's right. Taking a class like oil and water. You just... Certainly you're, taking, your, taking your workshops. You're with other people. Exactly. And so we have... Um, we have people walking by too so it's always fun to incorporate figures if you're able to you're very good at into doing your that. scene you're very good at and doing that, Lisa. i'm i'm quickly sketching a couple of these figures impressionistic you know very simple figures but they add immediately when you put a figure in it adds some it adds some different interest to your painting it, it definitely um, the, the human wants to see another human figure I exactly mean, that's, that's pretty much what uh what it boils down to right and our eyes immediately go to the figures so when you do include figures you really have to um, be pretty intentional about what you're doing and and give them a sense of life and give them that's a sense a of good movement point. that's a good point like I just did my the head was too large on this figure you have to make sure that you keep the head small enough um, because the heads tend to always be overdone for most people and so you really try to keep the head small enough and, in, you know, keep your figures in proportion to the landscape. I don't think I have to paint anything on there. See, just, and, it's and a foggy day and be done with it. If you look at Howard's painting, how nice that is, you can already see the values, the darkest values from your block in. Um, it could be a finished painting without even putting in color because you have your darks and your lights. And if you have the darks and lights, the color almost doesn't even matter. You can paint pushing, it any color. pushing some of that, making that conifer the center of interest. Exactly. It's a little taller than what's there. It's a little more stately than what's there, but that's kind of what I feel about it. Right. I want it to have that importance. That's your artistic license that you're, that you're pushing that. Correct. Right. So Howard, what colors did you use to do those, that block in? Well, basically I used uh, ivory black and I put some red in it, which gives me a brown. But as I, as I started looking for some of the background colors, then I went and put in a touch of orange, and that warmed that up a little bit. Uh -huh. And so that made it lean a bit towards a green, because orange and uh, yellow and, and black make green, but orange and, and black make kind of a very warm green. And as I say, usually I don't use white in a block, in, and you should not, because white is a very hard color to cover in, uh, in oils. So, but I did in this case, I did put some block in to make it a bit chalky and to really give you that sense of pushing back as those, those, those little bits of fog come rolling in like they are right now. That's right. coming in very hard right now, rolling in, coming in from that side. The, the foreshore or the far shore has uh, disappeared and maybe the foreshore will disappear too if this keeps building. Right. Right, and the thing I'm thinking about um, I'm not thinking about color yet because I'm just trying to get my composition of my sketch together. Um, and always thinking about in your composition, what is, what's, how is the balance? So if you have this large object, like Howard has this large conifer here, what's balancing it out over here, right? He's got this area here that's gonna be more pronounced. And so that will balance out that large conifer. So it's kind of, when you have a steel yard composition, you have a large object balanced out by a small, it can be distant object, it could be a rock, a sailboat, a tree, anything that's gonna bring the eye back to that spot. It's and, gonna balance and, out this larger area. And generally you place that far enough away from that large object so that it balances out. You exactly. Can't put it, you can't necessarily put it on the other third. So here, what I've done is I've raised some of this that that far shore which I saw a moment ago and that mass right here that small mass will, will counterbalance this large mass exactly so you're always thinking about that in your painting you don't want your painting it's like a seesaw you don't want it to be lopsided where you have you always have to balance out your and, painting and you don't want it to be so balanced that right that the viewer's eye bounces back and forth exactly so that's the other that's the other risk right so the other thing I always try to do, Howard, as I'm as we're as I'm painting, is kind of take a snap a photo of the block in and the value sketch, 
That's a good idea. Just so you have it for reference moving forward. You know, and then you kind of have a reference point for when you look back on the whole process of your painting, how it went. In other so. words, if you have a really nice value sketch, you can see whether you mess it up or not by right. painting over it. And then you can really be filled with regret. And That's right. That's right. Easily done. <laughs> Easily done. The no, thing is, the, the value sketches and the drawings can be so exciting. Yes. But don't ever try to save them when you're painting. They're there. They'll be underneath. They're the history of the piece. They'll always be there. But if you try to save your drawing, you're going to lose it. Right. So I am doing the same, taking a picture of my value sketch. And the other thing I'm doing right now is I'm actually adding in another figure. And the reason I'm doing that is these figures were kind of coming, you know, here's my third. These are, they're moving a little bit off the edge of the page. And so I kind of want them to be a group. And so by adding another figure, so that's something that you can do with any anything in your painting. If you feel like, oh, it's, it's going a little bit too far to the edge of the page, just add in, you know, add another tree to the mass that's closer to the center, right? Correct. And then you'll have that sense that this is all one mass and it's closer in here to the center. So you can see I added this little figure here who just brings it in a little bit more to the center. And that's, that's, a, that's vitally important. If your figures are walking out of your painting, if a sailboat is sailing out of the painting, it'll pull the viewer's eye out there. Right. So it's, uh, you, really, you really want to think about your viewer all the time. You want to think about the viewer. What's he going to see? What is he, she going to see? What is it going to be that's going to keep them in the painting long enough to see all the delicious little marks that you made, all those wonderful little things that are so, so much fun to make. And if they, if they don't have that, that, oh, ability that you put into it to keep them into the painting, keep them wanting to look at it, they'll just simply walk away. It'll be hanging on the wall. They'll take a look. Oh, that's nice. And then walk away from it. Right. Right. So if you're going to put figures in like I did in this painting, you just have to be really aware that that is what the viewer's eye is going to go to. So you want to step back and make sure that your figures are pleasing and that they're, they're an integral part of the scene. They're not an add-on that you just kind of threw in there because people will be able to tell that they're an add-on. Oh, yeah. So I think that these work pretty well as a group. I added this one. So yeah, that I think that's well placed. That that third figure that you added really brings it into right. one of the thirds on your right the, on your uh, exactly painting surface. I think that's lovely. And and because we have this foggy, really foggy scene, it's going to be different than our typical skies. Correct. Right? Correct. It's not going to be the blues that we often would do with you know. But it's still textural. There's still a Absolutely. lot of texture in that. And uh, that texture is, is going to have to be somehow shown throughout this, this sky, or, or it's just going to be this very dull right. gray. Now, that, I'm not saying that can't be effective. And again, every painting is, is an experiment. Every painting is, a, is a, a new experience and learning experience. Always take it for that. Don't ever worry about what you're doing with your painting if you feel like it's not going where you want it to go, believe me, it, you've learned something from it and you will grow from that. Exactly. Right. And so because students can get really kind of paralyzed in the process and, right. and thinking, I can't really do this. I'm not. And, and, you know, a huge part of this process and what we try to do in our teaching is just encourage people to just keep trying and experimenting because you're going to have a lot of paintings that you're not thrilled with. And that's just part of the process. It's just part of the learning process. You learn all those elements of what you want to do in the next painting every time you do a painting. Correct. So you can see I'm, I'm using my test strip here. And for watercolorists, I just highly recommend the test strip because it just allows you to see, you know, the, the consistency of your, your pigment and your water and how that's going to come together before you put it on the paper. Howard, you can... You don't necessarily need a test strip because you can really change it on your board. No, your but ever, ever, ever since I've seen you do that, 
Lisa, I, I have also at some point, at some times, I have used uh, uh, a, something of a test strip, if you want, just to, just to see if I was within the, in the ballpark. But you're right. I have a lot more leeway here because I can correct as I go along. I can make lots of corrections. Right. Now, the, the risk with trying to make a correction with this sky at this point is that there's so much white in this, it's very hard to cover white in oil paint. Right. And what I'm doing in my sky now is I'm getting in, even though it's really foggy, there's still that warm undertone to the sky. Absolutely. And in watercolor, so important to get that. That's right. Um, and so I'm getting, I'm using a raw sienna, very dilute, with a lot of water. You can see that it's very runny. And I'm using the hake brush, which is a, a Japanese um, brush that's made of goat hair. It's a, it's. It's just an amazing brush, really, and um, it allows you to really do skies. Well, it's amazing trees. when it's in your hands. <laughs> you know. Well, it, it takes a lot of practice to know how much pigment and water to have in this brush because it just holds a lot of water, but it allows for this freedom that's just wonderful in watercolor. So you can see I just kind of got this laid down and then I'm, I have to go right in while this is wet although because it's so damp out it's going to stay wet longer than usual I have a little more leeway today to not worry so much about my paint drying so quickly and now what color Howard are you thinking when you think of the sky this foggy well kind I, of I'm hazy also sky? I also think about the warmth that I need but I took a I took a red and I took a, um, a that's quinacridone red and, and viridian, put them together to make a gray, mm -hmm. added white to it until I got this gray slurry that leans a little bit towards a purple, yep. which is going to be slightly warmer. The purple will be yep. a little warmer, but I don't want this to be a purpley scene. Right. So I added some orange to that. Orange I mixed up with quinacridone red and a, and a uh, Hansa yellow. And I've done that, and just as you saw the warmth in the sky, so did I. But the difference is that instead of having it underneath, I can just lay it right on top. So I can, I can lay these. I can establish some of that, some of that existing gray, not overmix the, the color on my palette. So it's more marbleized, so to speak. So I have mm -hmm. several different colors coming through, and I can just lay those, right on top. They, they, they look like atmospheric breaks in the, in the sky, right. where that warmth will come through. That's interesting. Yeah, and I'm mixing up something akin to a gray also for my sky um, using yellow and red and, and and getting a little bit of violet in there and I make my violet with ultramarine and some alizarin um, and my sky is going to have uh, you know several layers of color I'm going to go in and do this and probably go back in and change it because I the other thing I'm noticing is that my uh, it is extremely wet, so you can see how this is in interacting with the paper as I'm putting the paint on. It's... Oh, God, it's you, lovely, though. But that it has is, a beautiful effect, and this oh, is one of the beauties of watercolor, is that oh, you can really yeah. get those foggy kind of effects, ethereal effects with watercolor. And as I get closer to the horizon, I'm just really almost just pulling my brush across there because I want that warmth to really glow right at the horizon where you see that. And right now, I'm just gonna leave this sky as it is. It's got this oh, it's lovely. violet, That's very subtle. Lovely. Um, very nice. And it'll dry back lighter, so I need to make a decision. Do I want to darken it up at all up, you know, higher up, although we see the sun is kind of trying to peek through up here. Right, and so that was, when you um, said that your horizon was warm, and I, I saw that also earlier, but I'm thinking about the sun coming through. And so for right. me, my intention is to make a warm spot where I actually am going to see the sun. I'm going to, right. to see that. Which is that, higher up here. That, right. I'm, and I'm going to get a little warmth in there too. Actually punch it up a little bit in that upper part of the painting. And this, this is challenging because this is the point when you put something on there when it's this wet and damp out that you don't completely know how it's going to, what's going to happen, how it's right. going to react. Right.
So the other option I have is because I have that warmth underneath, I can even just damp out a little bit nice. where you see the sun coming through. Right. And get some of that raw sienna coming through. Very nice. But I am going to put a little bit more warmth on there just to try to capture that coming through. And that's going to be some raw sienna and some a little cad yellow. Yeah, nice. Because the sun peeking through is really a big part of the effect of what's happening right I now. I agree. I agree. And we might even see that happening. And after we just said, don't chase the sun around. Um, well, after we see that happening, that effect, we might have to not chase the sun, but put that effect in where where we think it'll work best in the painting. But it's, right. a, it's a lovely look and a great feel. Almost like the it's it's an element of hope. Right. You know, it's actually going to be a nice day. That sun's finally going to come out. and Right. And in watercolor, you just have to be really careful doing this because... Um, it's challenging and you can see I'm it's 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 as I do it I have to really be aware of making sure I'm blending this in with the other colors that are there so that you don't have this abrupt, abrupt line yes. and the paper yeah. is just completely buckled right now so I'm gonna kind of allow that let that be for a bit because the other thing with watercolor, you don't want to overwork the sky. Why is that, Lisa? It's, if you start going into it too much, then you will leave these, you'll basically leave marks that just become very evident that you went into it. So you can see, Howard, what I did here is I just kind of blended that. Nice. But I don't want to go too far with that, because if I continue to go in with that color, it's just going to be... It's going to overtake and, and kind of ruin the freshness of that sky and that transparency I see. that you get. So I'm going to come forward and start doing the trees now. Now, what are you doing with your sky? Well, I'm still I'm still working that down, trying to get the trying to get the the sense of depth to it. It's a certain amount of of warms and cools within there and they're very close in value range i'm not looking for anything extreme i just want that textural atmospheric feeling that you get when you have different layers of of paint in place now the, the beauty with with my sky is if if i mess it up i can i can just scrape the whole thing out and start right. again you don't have that option so to keep that freshness i still want to minimize the marks i make but the, the fact is that I can, I can redo this if I really have to. That gives me a certain amount of freedom, I think. Right. Right. And that is one of the real challenges I hear from a lot of students. You know, that I ended up painting oils because the watercolor was, it was so challenging. And it's, but, what, you know, it's, it's really the decision that you are going to experiment and really have a facility with the paints that you're using because once that happens then you just get this these beautiful effects that you really can't get any other way watercolor is pretty unique in that way correct and um it's just that kind of medium that as you can see i'm right now i'm doing my trees and this is one of the challenges of watercolor is it's extreme the paper is extremely wet and so everything you can see what it's doing it's it's um really runny and so I'm having to go with thicker pigment than I even would imagine but you also can get these really pretty amazing effects if you allow the really allow the paint to do what it wants to do and you just get these beautiful um, I think I think that was very important colors. you get the paint to you, you sort of let it do what it wants to do however I know that you still have a great deal of control over that. Right. Using a big brush the way you do, you still have a great deal of control. You use the edge of the brush, you use a corner of the brush, and all of that gives you that great facility with your Now I'm using finish. I'm using pretty thick paint right now, and it's still you can see how much see how that's kind of blooming out there? That's showing you how wet everything is right now. Um, 
And that is the challenge of this scene. Do it, painting this kind of foggy, uh, really damp scene in watercolor. This is, I, I, we've been out a few times when it's been this wet before, and you really have to um, just make a decision that you're going to let it be a wet into wet painting. You know, that there's, there's going to be areas where you're not going to have that precision, but the way these trees are, you don't want that precision. It's, it, if you look at it, it is all blending together, and it's just right, amazing. Right, and right, So you kind of let that happen with watercolor, and it really is a, is a, has, is a beautiful effect. So I'm just, I'm trying to use multiple colors on my brush and really let those blend and you can see how what a nice effect that is and you don't have to have a lot of water right now because the paper is so wet so you're using you're using a heavier pigment than i normally would normal. under these conditions uh -huh, right uh -huh. and now i'm going to get some of the further back trees that are that are um you know a little that they're it's very foggy back there and so I'm, but I'm going to add some cools to those trees because cool colors recede. We want them to recede. We want the appearance that those are moving back more. And so by cooling those down, um, that will, that will add to that effect. And that's, I'm using some cerulean and some ultramarine for that. What was the first color? Cerulean. Oh, some cerulean. Yeah. yeah. Which I often, I, I do use a lot of cerulean. I know you make your own cerulean, Howard. How do you, how do you make your own cerulean? Well, I make, I make cerulean with ultramarine blue yeah. and viridian green. And, and uh, viridian, again, used as a modifier. So uh, ultramarine blue has a bit of, has a bit of, um, uh, of red in it. It came from the semi-precious stone originally of lapis lazuli. And it made such a wonderful blue that they've actually kept that formula when they started to synthesize the pigment and so there's a touch of red in in that blue it's a sense of red in there and um, the uh, green mixes with that red and grays it out so the cerulean that I make it, it is a signature color of mine but it's it's grayed out and most guys even on the brightest of days most blues have a gray element to them and so a cerulean for oil colors that comes out of a tube can be can be way too strong. Okay. Right, and with water, I mean, I use it, and I always mix with other things. I don't. I rarely would just use straight cerulean on anything. Well, I'm you don't. You don't. It. You don't use anything out of the tube anyway. Right. You're always mixing your tube. Colors, exactly. Which is what you should be doing. That's right. what everybody should be doing. Because then really. you're really developing your own palette and your own colors and finding out what you really like That's right. um, to use. That's right. Not just squeezing it right out of the tube. That's right. And the thing I'm noticing right now that's so interesting back here is that you've got these warm... Now the background is warm behind all these dark trees that are coming forward. Do you see that? How it's lighter back there because of what's happening with the sun. Right. And that was not happening earlier. That sun breaking through like that. Exactly. So I'm kind of getting, I'm trying to get a little bit of that warmth back there. And then I'm going to punch up some of these in the front, uh, and which I'm going to have to do with really strong pigment once this dries. Because this is just, everything is so runny right now. Uh, because my paper is just completely absorbed all this fog that's rolled in. <laughs> right. <laughs> Basically. Oh, it's got to be 100% humidity right now. Oh, yeah. It's almost like you're painting underwater. Yeah. And so it's, it's very challenging, but it's, you know, again, all these challenges, every time we go out and paint, you can't be worried about doing the perfect masterpiece. You're just experimenting. You're trying to see how things are going to unfold. And it's funny how that masterpiece will just show up. Mm-hmm. It'll just be there. And even the background has changed. Now we can actually see the farther, um, that far the shore. far horizon yeah. and the far yeah. shore back there. Yeah. And I'm going to do that as a very grayed out, blued out, um, far shore. 
and everything is so runny right now. So you'll see that I'm often um, prying off my hockey brush. So what I do a lot is I do a lot of this to get a lot of that excess water out of there because it really can get to be too much and then you kind of lose control of your painting. And you, so, you'll, you'll do that even without this extreme wetness in oh yeah. the air. I've noticed you do that. Yes. And that's a key element. I think a lot of watercolorists are just too wet. Right. And they everything gets sort of just anemic. They're, the paintings get anemic because they get very washed out. And so oh, that's why you're always testing to make sure that the consistency of the paint and water is where you want it to be before you start putting it on the paper. Interesting. Yeah. And that in watercolor is just so key. And, you know, I always suggest to students just get your, get your sketchbook like this and just practice little line and wash paintings, little practice paintings so you don't feel like you're under such major pressure to do a ma masterpiece every time you go out and then you get tense and you get nervous just and then you're unhappy with the piece don't right. let that happen don't let that happen right to you. so i did my background here just very very simple very very loose wash with some blues and a little bit of violet in there and that just pushes that way back and then once this all dries i'm going to come back into these trees and punch up some of these darker trees Howard, how are you handling? Well, I'm now I'm I'm down into some of the the, the key elements of this uh, of the painting, and so I'm getting into putting some blobs of color, painting in blobs, painting and and not trying to uh, save my drawing, not necessarily redrawing at this point, but putting in some color notes as that sun was there. Now that fog's back in a little bit, and we've lost some of that. We're back to doing lights and darks, but there are a few notes here that'll give me a, a leg up when it actually comes time to finishing up the painting. Very subtle changes. I want to keep those. I want to keep those changes just as subtle as possible. Still introducing a touch of color so that so that the viewer has a sense that there's. Uh, you know, there's color there. There's, a, there's some trees. There's some. Uh, right. You can put darks on at the very end if you have to. Um, Van Gogh did it, so anybody can do it. Exactly. You work your way to the darks. Right. So right. that's that's the difference. And of course, the major difference between oil painting and and uh, watercolor. Oil painting goes from dark to light and watercolors go from light to dark. Exactly. And that, when you're making the switch back and forth between them, that is one of the hardest things to navigate, is to realize, oh, okay, I can, you know, that I have to shift my thinking about what's happening first. What am I putting down? In watercolor, you're always putting your, generally putting your lights down first and working towards those darks. What I'm doing right now is I'm trying to get the right color for my water because the water is going to reflect what's happening in the sky. And so I'm really trying to get that subtle, that lightness that we see and yet there's a, there's a violet. So it's, it's, there's a lot of experimentation with the test strip in order to get that where I want it. And that again is the beauty of the test strip. Right. Whereas I'm, I'm putting that actually down on my canvas and uh, and if I have a problem with it if it doesn't doesn't read right if it bothers me if it's a, a jarring jarring mark I can just take it right out right you have a lot more flexibility to do that correct and so I'm gonna what I do when I do my water I'm gonna lay this in and then I pretty quickly I'm gonna do my reflections because I want them to meld into blend into this water and so I'm going to move fairly quickly with that, fairly rapidly. Well, you do move very rapidly with your throughout your whole painting, uh, maintaining wet edges certain places, and uh, which is very much of that wet uh, wet on wet technique. Right. Right. And in watercolor, that's just essential. You really ha you're always 
you're always thinking about that. And that's one of the reasons that there's rapidity in watercolor that a lot of people don't like to deal with because you don't have a lot of time. It, you know, and at certain you, points and in your you're painting, not rushing. You're not rushing. You're not rushing. You have can, to go with the flow. Right. But you don't have as much time as you might in oils to be able to say, all right, I can go back in and kind of, you know, do some to this. So it takes some of the pressure off when you're doing oils, I think. Right. And in watercolor, you just have to, it's just practice. You just have to learn to do it. But I think the reason that I love watercolor is that once you start to be able to do that, there's a freedom to it uh -huh. that is pretty unique. And by that you mean a freedom of rap rapid marks and and uh, quickly done paintings? Is that what you mean by that? It's 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 there's a I think there's a freshness of marks ah, because yeah. it has to be quickly done and can't be over. You really can't overthink it too much because if you do, you really kill the painting. And then that's what happens: is a watercolor that's overworked. You can tell it's a watercolor that's overworked. <laughs> well, I think that's true of any painting. And, right. So, and so there, there has to be a, 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 a shorthand that you develop to make these, especially outside, it's a shorthand that you develop that reads as the objects that you want them to read. Exactly. So now I'm going in with my reflections, which I have to do pretty quickly. And remember, darks reflect lighter, lights reflect darker. And you can see how runny this is. So if I make them too runny, it's going to be a problem, so I'm really going to be fighting a little bit to keep this at the kind of consistency I want, not go too dark, uh, but to really try to get these reflections in as quickly as I can. So, and the beauty of reflections in watercolor is that you uh, can get this freshness to them that is not overworked uh -huh. and you know kind of is you know reflections have a quality to them that people really like and I think they like it because they're not controlled right they they are fresh they are um, these shapes that are not overly controlled overly engineered uh -huh. and that's why people one of the reasons people like them a lot that's, in that's, paintings, I, right? I, and it's true. They they really are drawn to to reflections. Right. Um, there's something, uh, yeah, ethereal about it. Yes. Somehow, they just they they see that they they like it. They want to they want to keep looking at it. There's something exactly something interesting about that. Exactly. So I'm trying to get mine. I'm going a little bit darker than I think I should because I know it's going to dry back a lot. And in watercolors. If it looks right on, it's probably not right when it dries. <laughs> As a rule of thumb, it's probably going to dry back and be a little bit anemic. So make sure that you are, you know, going a little bit probably darker than you think you need to. And just experiment with that. For you, Howard, I know you can you know, when you're, when you're getting your colors down, you, you know that you have the option to go in and do a little bit of changing of that. So it just gives you a little bit more um, freedom in that way. Well, there's a certain amount of flexibility. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's true. So you can see I'm trying to get these, get these reflections in fairly rapidly, and then I can kind of step back and see if I'm happy with them. You don't want to go back in as a watercolorist and do too many changes to reflections. Because it can kind of kill the freshness. Well that's right, that's right. So and that's true with any that's true with any kind of painting. I yep. mean you can do that with a with oil paintings too and a, especially if you use a lot of brushwork and or so you find a variety of marks that you want to use and if you if you have some place that doesn't look quite right, you draw your knife through it, or you pull right. your brush through it, smudge it up, and uh, loosen it up so that you're not so overworked, or doesn't have that impression of being so overworked. Right. And what I'm doing now is I'm gonna I'm using a thirsty brush, 
and I just kind of got all as much water as I could out of my brush and I'm going to pull this across and this is going to create that nice effect of wind across the water of ripples and it's a beautiful device to use in watercolor just don't overdo it like anything else don't put in 20 and so I'm going to actually pull through I know I'm probably standing in front a little bit of the camera but I'm going to pull through some of these so you get that sense of a ripple happening on the water and there is a lot of rippling going on well, in this there water certainly is. and, that, and, and those, it creates a nice those effect. reflections come and go because of the right of the way the breeze picks up and then right and then kind of lets back and flow back a little right uh, and so I'm kind of using I'm using my brush and you can see how wet this is staying because it's still it's still um, you know, I'm able to still work with this and it really hasn't dried. So I'm kind of using this brush just to pull through and you can get that beautiful effect of the wind rippling across the water and just gently pulling through those watercolors. So you can see how all the different colors that are in these reflections and how interesting that is. So I'm getting ready to do some marks on my beach. And I'm going to try to do this in kind of one sweeping mark if I can, because it's a really nice way to keep it fresh in watercolor right. and not overwork it. When you have an area like this, you want to see if you can get it in one sweep as much as you possibly can. Right. Because um, as soon as you start going back into it and back, it, it just it gets overworked and it loses that fresh quality. So I'm using kind of a, an array of colors for my beach because there's really um, there's yellow, gray, mustard. It's kind of a mustard color. I there's, love that. I there's love that. There's almost violets that on the rocks. That mustardy color, yeah. And so I'm using some raw sienna. I'm using cad yellow light. I'm getting some blues in there and even a little bit of red, which will, the, the red, blue, and yellow will create a gray. As you can see on my test strip, I'm really getting this nice mix that has a little bit of that mustard right, yellow color right. in it. And I have several colors on my brush. Yeah, and that's, that's the beauty nice. of these large brushes. You get a, several colors. So as you sweep across the beach, for example, you're going to see those colors um, all come out in, right. in a very fresh way. So right. let me see, get a little bit more water on my brush. And now's the moment of truth. Moment After all this talk truth. about doing a single sweep, I better do it. So you can see I did that sweep for the beach here in just, you know, one or two strokes, keeping it really fresh and not trying not to overwork that. And you right. can see how many of the colors came through right. because yes. I had different yes. colors on my brush. That's just lovely. Really nicely done. And you just, in watercolor, you just want to let yourself do that and not overwork it. And I will go back in and darken up some of this, but the basic, you know, your, your basic marks, you want to have that just freshness and let the beauty of that watercolor, you know, really come through. And so right there, that established that sweep of the beach and now I'm going to get in and start working on some of these rocks. How are you handling the rocks Howard? I'm minimizing the rocks as best I can. I want them to be less important and I don't want to take away by putting too much detail and, and I might find one or two rocks that I'll use uh, and make them stand out a little but for the most part I'm looking for an overall view as if I'm squinting my eyes. And I think one of the things that I like the best is, is those little bits of that, that green uh, orange color to, the, to that seaweed. I just think that's just marvelous oh, color. Yeah. And the little pops of light, that, that subtle as they are, they can add a lot to the painting. You can also use that to separate some of the some of the background to the foreground. 
and that going back in and some of these blobs of paint that I've put down, I can now work into them and try to turn them into something, some object that they were when I first saw them as a point of, as a, as, you know, just putting them down as a blob of color initially. Now I can go back in and draw them out a little. Right. And sometimes it's easy as just la laying a light color on top and sometimes a little more complicated. Right, and for a watercolorist, I think, so when doing a scene like this, the challenge is that those tops of those rocks are lighter than the bottom, right? Correct. And so you're trying to kind of save that and have that come through. Keep your rocks fresh, right? So I'm doing a little bit of some light colors here and and then I'm going to be laying down much darker pigment and actually using a credit card to kind of scrape out a little bit of those tops of those rocks, which is, creates a nice effect. There's but you don't no want to such get... thing as using a credit card when you're doing oil. <laughs> Unless you're paying for your oil paint, right? Well, that's right. <laughs> but the only time. exactly. So, but but what I try to do with doing that, using the credit card, is really getting that, and you'll see it in a minute, is getting that, you know, the sense of the um, texture of the rock. It helps you achieve some of that. Right, right, because you're scrumbling, it's, it's you're scrumbling basically across scrumbling it. across the top of that. Yeah, right. That's, that's lovely. And so here, I'm that's doing some effective. of these rocks here, and I'm going to pull that through to kind of just show. Now there's this wonderful light hitting on that beach, uh, just next to where that stone wall is. And finding that light, I think, is, is critical. That sun has come out, that really makes the the uh, wall itself have shadow. And again, the value's got to be correct. But then that little that little bit of uh, striking of sunlight right on that beach is just lovely. There'll be a real play of light there. Right. And that, it, it, that is the challenge right now, is the light has changed so many times in the midst of doing this painting. And how much do you chase it? How much do you try to do what was sort of happening when we got here? I think that's, with plein air, that is a big challenge. Absolutely. So there's, again, you, you make a decision at some point in your painting and you say, all right, it's going to be the light that it was half an hour ago. It's not necessarily well, going and to... That's, that's the value. that's the value of your value sketch. Right. Because right. that really keeps you true to what it was that you saw and putting it down so that you... I can't help myself but to try to find some of those highlights that are coming through now because I think they're going to really play against the darks that I started out with. I really like those grasses and I can put them in front of some of the other darks. Yeah, and that's, that's another challenge I will have as a watercolorist is how to contend with the lighter grasses that are right here. And what do you do? You scrape and out? Do you... I will, well, I'll probably try to use a yellow and some raw sienna and a few colors like that, but I will probably scrape out a little bit uh -huh. also. Uh -huh. So you can see what I'm doing with these rocks here is I'm punching up some warm color as they come forward, keeping them cool as they're receding, and keeping them pretty impressionistic. Right, so I'm going to start in on the grasses here. that are behind that wall and use some raw sienna, some real warms to try to raw sienna and some cad yellow mixed together. Just like a touch of red to kind of get almost a little pink to them. They almost have a little pink hue to them. So one of the benefits of the test strip or of a sketchbook is you're just going to experiment with color a little bit. And you really, by using a limited palette and really experimenting, you start, you learn which colors work well together in your palette. 
right? Right. And people, you know, a lot of students will want us to sort of say, well, mix this with this, but, and, and it's true, you'll learn from teachers, but you really have to practice on your own a good amount to just know what colors in your palette are mixing, how they're mixing together, how they what, work And what together. they do when they touch each other. Some, right. Some colors in watercolor make the other, other spread away from them. Some exactly. draw them in. Uh, and that's just, that experimentation. You could, you could tell your students all about it numerous times. Right. And until they actually do right. a lot of it themselves, you're just never going to get that feel. There's nothing like brush time. You've got to put the time in. Exactly. And I love that phrase, brush time. It's just kind of, you know, it's, you know, people will come up to us and say, you're so talented. It's, it's amazing what you do. It's, it's a lot, it, honestly, it's a lot of hours that we spend. It's a lot of time that we spend, like any other skill, just working it out and just getting that facility with the tools you're using, which is your brushes, right? Which right. is your paints, you know? So whatever, whatever it is, you, you have to develop that facility with it, and it only is gonna come through practice. That's right. And plein air painting with a group or coming out and taking a class and learning that is such a great way to do it because you have that camaraderie and that, you know, sense of just you're, you're working together toward this, you know, uh, you know, toward developing yourselves. Oh, that's right. I, I mean, we've, every time that we're out painting, students will say, no matter what I paint today, it was so great to be out here. Well, that's true. Uh, you that's know, right. it was so and, great yeah. just to be out here doing it. And, so, and that, and, and it, sometimes it takes other people to, to motivate you to come. Absolutely, you make that you make that commitment. Now you've got to be there. You've got friends you're going to meet up, or other right. artists, or right. or heaven forbid, you paid for a workshop, and <laughs> you've got to be there. <laughs> right. But the thing about brush time is what I what I love is somebody will say, well, how long did it take you to paint that painting? And I'll say, well, it took two and a half hours and forty years. Right. Because that's what it takes. It right. takes putting the time in. Right. And that's not to discourage people who say, well, I don't have 40 years. I, I'm, I'm really busy. I don't have time. And I think... Well, that's why we're here. We're going to save them 20 years of experimenting so that they will be able to skip some of those laborious times that we right. spent experimenting, learning about how things work. Right. Now we can explain it to them. We can help them with it. We can and, give a shortcut. And push them. Yeah. Exactly. And, it, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of our way of saying, no matter what's happening, just stick with it. And, you know, don't feel discouraged. Even if you've done a series of paintings that you thought, oh, this isn't quite where I wanted to go, just keep at it because you're going to all of a sudden hit that point that you go to another level. That's right. As you if practice you, you, more. If you move in plateaus. Yeah, exactly. You'll, right, you'll make some leaps, you'll make some real significant leaps and get to another level and then you'll sort of plateau out there and say oh what am I doing and then you'll do it again and that's the process of growth and that's true in anything that's right whether you're learning a language or a sport or painting it's that's what's going to happen but when you're outside when you're out painting and you're out in nature there is an experience that's just really unique and I think in, in the process of trying to capture a scene like this, like you can even see as Howard and I are looking at this, the, the things that are similar and the things that are really different in our vision of what we're seeing. So you, it gives you a chance to capture your unique vision. And you're not of, gonna get that any other way. And you're right, and it, of that scene, of that place. And it's really an amazing experience to do that. Yep. So we definitely, we do a lot of studio painting, but plein air for us is just so essential to what we do as artists. Well, it helps you develop your visual memory. It helps you find confidence in the marks that you make. Right. Sometimes you have to push yourself. Exactly. And what I'm doing right now, speaking of confidence in the marks you make, I'm, I'm um, working on these figures and I've spent a lot of time working on figures, as Howard can attest to, because we, you know, we work on that in class. We work on it just sort of doodling and sketching and 
constantly, constantly working on figures because they are such an essential part of a painting. When you're including them, they can make or break a painting. That's right. And other things also. I mean, uh, you spent a long time just doing doing your skies, learning how to right. how to make your skies work for you, and I think that was incredibly. It was time well spent. Exactly. You know, and that, that might be hard to do. You know, you you think, well, I should be able to do that. Why can't I paint a sky? Well, you put the brush time in. Right. So you made yourself go out and paint skies. How boring can that be, really? I mean, right. although yeah, it's fun, but if you have to 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 do that and force yourself to to learn the techniques it takes, you did it, and that's right. remarkable. And, and, it, and, and, you know, it's, it, but it was, if you're really doing it because you want to develop as a painter, when you're developing as a painter, you're doing more than developing as a painter. You're developing yourself. Oh, that's a good point. And, I, and we have a lot of students talk to us about that. You know, how the experience of just going out, you know, with a group or by themselves and doing some sketching and being outside, how much they learned about themselves and honestly how they dealt with challenges, how they dealt with um, obstacles that came up before them as they were painting. It's, it's sort of like a way that you're, you're gaining your confidence in yourself and your ability to, to do these things. And like you say, that applies to everything they do in life, really. Right. So if you want that metaphor that painting's like, like living, well, I would say paint in oil, don't paint in that wishy-washy watercolor <laughs> stuff. Yeah, exactly. Take, take the route where you can go back in and revise a little bit more. However, however, if you look at Lisa's painting right now, what she has done is just, just fantastic. It's a beautiful painting with lots of feeling to it. And really nailing that with this wonderful simplicity of brushwork. And leaving out plenty, you don't need all the detail. You don't need every little thing talking to somebody. You, you right. can leave out little bits and pieces that will actually make the other parts more important in your painting. And so you can see with my figures, I just kind of got them. They're very impressionistic. You know, they're just almost little dots, you know, over on the side. But you immediately look at it and you immediately know that that's three people walking. And that's what you want. You want that impression that the viewer is going to almost see themselves there, you know, and, and want to be there and want to be in that painting. So if you are including figures, you know, that's, that's how I often think about it is I want to walk around this scene. I want to see what's I, going on. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. I want to be one of these figures, that's you know, in, in this little scene. And so you want your viewer to feel that way. Um, about your painting, that they want to walk around your painting. That's right. And so that's the reason that composition is so key because you're, you know, you want your viewer to stay in the painting so that they can explore all the different interesting elements that you included. Correct. So I'm going to step back now for a moment after doing my figures. It's a good stopping point for me to step back and see where... I think things, how things are progressing, and also look at Howard's painting. I like what you've done there, Lisa. That's, that's, you could stop right where you are and you would have, have a painting that reads well and that's understood and, and actually, quite honestly, has a really marvelous feel to it. Thank you. I think I will, I'm going to bring this up a bit because I can see that this is kind of dipping down. And I think, Howard, your painting is, beautifully captures the darks of those trees against that sort of silvery, violety sky. And, and then the warms that are popping through here. You know, and I think they really stand out because they're against all those neutrals. Well, the thing is to, and, to have found that at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been over and over, I've been back and forth on that part of the painting, 
couple of times. It's been a couple of different scenes there, but I think that is coming to something that I want it to end up. I don't like the three marks, specifically different marks there, so I have to tie yeah. those together a little bit, and I'll be able to do that. At the end, I can do that, as you could too. Right. That's, that's, that is part of where the watercolor, you can go back in and put some of those marks in. Exactly. And I often will. I'll, and, and sometimes I'll, you know, it'll be an hour later or the next day that I go back and I really look back at my painting and I'll do a couple more additions to it. Um, a couple little tweaks of just small things, but something that it just needed to just... Um, you know make that slight difference because sometimes with watercolor as it dries back you really do see it differently yeah and realize this really needs you know this needs to be punched up a bit that type of thing so and with oils too i know you do the same thing howard where you will step back and really look at it and take stock of it I, afterwards i think what happens with oils is that i do have a lot more liberty and ease of changing something right um, as long as the oil is 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 still wet or hasn't hasn't hardened yet exactly and how long does that process take typically for the oil to dry or harden well to to get to a point where you can't do something with it uh, in some cases it's only just a few days yeah. You know, if you put a lot of heavy paint on, it can be, it can be considerably longer. Um, but just the way, it's just a process of drying that oil paints actually change their molecular construction. They don't, they harden. They really don't dry. Mm -hmm. And so um, they do get tacky. And so then you feel like you can be safe in handling the painting. But in fact. Uh, it takes, it'll take a hundred years for an oil painting really to, to completely change its, its structure and become what it's supposed to be in the end. The, uh, but as far as going back in and working on it, which I think was what your question was, yeah. um, you can do that for up to a week. You have to be very careful not to, not to pick up something or disrupt some, some part of it that's already started through that okay. molecular change. Right. Howard, can you take a step? So now I'm at the phase where I'm pretty close to being done, but I'm going to get some shadows just darken up underneath these rocks with a little bit of violet, gray violet, so that the rocks have some solidity. You want the rocks to be sitting on the ground, right? And solid, yeah. And solid, yeah, exactly. That's right. So that you don't want a bunch of mushrooms sitting there, a bunch of... Right. And so getting some kind of a gray in there, just on the ground below the rocks, can, can really help with that. To create some sense of shadows there. And it's, this scene is changing again rapidly. There's fog coming. Unbelievable. You see the fog rolling over there. It's so beautiful out it, here. It really is. It's amazing. It makes for difficult painting, but the challenge is what you're looking for. You don't want it to be too easy. Of course not, right. So with dark, doing some of these darks, I'm just doing them in a few places. I don't have to do it everywhere. But it's just enough to give that sense that those rocks are pop that up a little. You know, sitting sitting on the beach, sitting in the sand, right? Yep. That they're not floating. That's right. And then I will probably do just a little bit along this shoreline, just a rock or two up here in this area in a nice warm color, nice warm colors to bring those rocks forward. 
And that's all it takes. One or two rocks and people will believe that they're seeing rocks. Right. And you don't have to, right, you don't have to do 50 rocks. You can do a few and it will be enough to convince them that that's a rocky beach. And that's allowing the viewer to do some of that work, right, Howard? Correct. You want that viewer to be part of the art process. Right. You want the viewer to come in and do some of the mixing for your colors. Their eyes will see color differently than you, so why not just leave some colors next to each other that, that will vibrate and, and just show themselves to the viewer in a different way than you even ever even thought you would see it. Right. That's just sort of some of the subtle changes that have to happen. So my rocks that I'm putting on here, as you can just see, it's kind of one stroke and it's very simply done and trying not to overwork that, but trying to get just get a, a sense of a few of these rocks that are right at the edge of the water there that just will pull this shoreline forward and, you know, keep the viewer looking at this painting, but it's just going to be a little very impressionistic. It doesn't have to be overly spelled out. Here, we're right back to that shorthand again. Right. And the more you do that, the easier it'll be for the, for the viewer to make his interpretation of not only your color mixing, but the shapes you've made and the different things that will keep their interest. Right. So I've just got very, very quick indication of some rocks here. I'm going to get the top a little bit lighter here. Oops. Drop my credit card somewhere. That was, your, that was the one you're <laughs> going to use for lunch, right? <laughs> Now I'm starting to look for some of the details that I need to find that'll make this a little more drawn out. Without overdoing it, coming back into some of the areas, look at some of the shadows that have developed now, kind of like how that's happened. Indicate those with larger marks. Value change is a big thing at this point, that, that weak light coming through. A lot of grayed out color still. I think one of the challenges with with oils today was that they're they seem a bit the paint seems long. It seems. What do you mean viscous. by that? Yeah, it just it has a viscosity to it that is making it a bit hard to push around, and it's picking up some of the. Some of the paint from underneath, oh. and then with this break it, in the in in the in the clouds or in this fog, suddenly there's there's these wonderful pops of color. How are we going to either show that or skip it? We're at a point right. now where it's very hard to see anything to right. see what it is we started with. Right, and I'm not going to chase that around. I'm my painting is almost done. Well, so if, if this was a dueling to... demo, I would have already won. Oh, yeah. But we won't yeah. get into that. Well, it has to be so... good, too, you know, not just done quickly. <laughs> but what I'm doing now, and this is important for watercolorists, is start looking at areas where you have whites that were not intentional. I mean, on this beach, I like the scrumbling. I'm going to leave that. But there's other areas where the whites are distracting. And so I'm going to go in and just with a very dilute... Uh, wash, go in and sort of damp down some of those areas because if you have too many of those whites coming through that were unintentional, it'll take away from what you want people to see. Well, it silhouettes the... Yes. You know. And by just doing... See, I'm used doing a very dilute wash, but even just doing it right there was just enough so that there's not this halo around my figures um, and it allows you to see them better. 
and allows you to see the grasses better and everything. So it just, that area just came alive by just doing that little, making that little change. I'm gonna do a little bit here. And make sure that the color that you're going back in with is the color that you want. Don't just start dabbing a color, right? Right. Just to fill in the whites because that also can be really problematic. And that's true with anything, anything you're doing with any painting. You don't just pick any color at random and don't mix a color and, and think, well, that's not going to work. I'll put it over here. Stay with the color you're mixing until you get exactly what you want. Right. Because it's not going to work and then you're going to regret it and think, well, that that's right. didn't help anyway. So I'm trying to just dampen down some of these areas of, of white that are, I think, are distracting. And I think it does make a big difference when you go into your painting at the end as a watercolorist and do that. So you're cleaning up your whites, the halos around different objects. Right. And you're using a proper color to do that. Do you ever put a counter charge of color? Do you ever look for something opposite on the color wheel to make something, you know, some part of that pop? Um, it depends on, yeah, I do do that. It depends on what area of the painting I'm in, right? And if it's, if it's an area of interest that I really want to pop. Uh -huh. So what I just did was I just darkened this up a little bit, Howard, right here. Lovely. Just to kind of give a little more depth to that beach. That's lovely. And that warmed it up too. So yes, right. that so really made it come forward. So this is the point in the painting when, when you're going to do a few of those things, just to give a bit more depth um, and feeling. And because everything is dried back, you have a better sense of where to go with that. Sometimes it's hard to know when everything's still drying and everything was so wet here today. Right. That with some of that, it was hard. But you can see I'm even using my finger to kind of scrumble and just create this messiness of the beach. That's great. I like how you did that. That's, it's pretty brave to do something like that. It's, Especially you know, in oils. <laughs> well, in oil, put your thumb you in it. No, you don't want to exactly. do that. But, but it's brave to do it in watercolor because it's not as easily repaired. Right. And you're only, and again, you're going to learn that through experimentation, through trying it. Um, and, and, you know, just, this is where these test strips and the, and the sketchbook is wonderful. Because you can practice all these things and feel that you don't have any pressure. Right? Correct. If you mess it up, who cares? And sometimes you'll do your nicest paintings or sketches in your sketchbook because you're not worried about it. That's right. So right now I'm just I'm just getting these these areas that are where there's just kind of white just randomly there and it's unintentional so I want it to be I want it to be intentional I want this to be the messy beach here and so I just went in and with my finger just kind of scrumbled that up a little bit so you get the sense of the grasses and the mud on the beach. So Howard, what are you doing at this point in your well, painting? How I'm, are you... I'm really trying to redraw some of the original the original bits and pieces that I had done. Okay. Um, after putting in a lot of the, of the uh, darks and, and, and these blobs of color to indicate a lot of the things that I saw, I'm now going back in and trying to redraw those objects so they come together a little bit more cohesively. Being careful not to overdo that because I'm not looking to make this, uh, you know, some sort of an illustration piece. I'm, look, I'm making it look at, have it look as if I, uh, as if I stood there, what I felt when I was there more than what I saw. Right. So that's impressionism, right? Yeah. That you're trying to. It really to... is, and it's in, and even on it borders on something of an expressionist uh, attitude. And what does that mean? Well, what do you mean by expressionist? The expressionist, you're, you're, you have an expression of what it is. You're expressing yourself at what you saw. You're not necessarily. And how it make you how it made you feel. Exactly. Right. So you're not necessarily trying to be too illustrative with it. Now the risk is I keep looking at things I want to change and I've got to stop myself right. from doing that. So right. I've got to be at a place where I can just stop painting right. and it's, just let things be as they are. And I think this is also the point where if you've, did, if you've done a value sketch, now you're looking back at your value sketch and seeing how true was I to it with my darks and my lights. And I'm pretty happy with this. Um, 
the one area that I see I wasn't as dark here so I might go in and punch that up a little bit but I'm almost hesitant to do that now because the painting has become its own it's and, and it's done it's lovely. and it's essentially done I don't see I have a few more white areas I'm gonna calm down here a little bit but there's not a lot more that I'm gonna do because at this point is where I can really do too much well, and kind of it can lose its you know what what it, what made it fresh exactly and I don't want to do that no that's exactly right so you get to a point where it's like keep me away from the painting Just right step away. away right it's, now. it's the point of step away from the painting yeah, right that's right And so you can also see as my painting progresses, I do sometimes go to a smaller brush as I'm doing a little bit more of this kind of detail work, you know, where I'm trying to get some of those whites filled in. But I think that worked pretty well to get those whites, you know, calm down here and here so that the whites that are there are, I want intentional. them, are yeah. intentional yeah. whites. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a good point. Uh, now I'm just trying to get rid of some of these little marks that I made that, and pull them in and make it part of the tree. You, your eye doesn't see that. They might see it here. You know, this is where they'd be important to right. have, but not as far back on the painting as... Right, and I'm going to take a risk here and I'm going to darken up, because I'm, I'm going to darken this just a tad so that this these this foreground tree stands out it's too close in value i think howard to uh -huh. these background i see so i'm gonna just darken that up a bit well i think you're doing and, the right thing and but like you say you there's a certain risk there's to that. a certain risk because i'm pretty happy with it right now but i also know that by following my value sketch that was my original guide to what i was doing here right and so you kind of come back to that. If you keep coming back to that, it's probably not going to steer you wrong. Well, in your case, really, it will help you uh, because you are going from light to dark. Right. And you can adjust those values that way uh, fairly, well, a little more easily, perhaps, than, than me, who has my value sketch completely covered up with my paint. Right. You see what I'm you saying? You can't so now, see it anymore. It, right. Right. And so I'm trying to stay true to the value, not necessarily even to what's out there right now, but more to my value sketch. Now you're into your painting. Right. right? Now so it's my it's, painting. You look at your painting. Now so it's So there's the that this dark is, right there. Yeah. And it made this pop and come forward ahead of all this. So yeah. I was concerned that this was too... They were, they were bleeding together. They were bleeding together. Much. It was too close. So I'm going to get some of that into these other trees also so you can see as a watercolorist you know once you let it dry back still let some of that underpainting show through don't lose that beautiful uh color that's back there but you know get some more depth and some more detail and it's gonna just make it pop and generally i'm happy when i do these things i try to you know if i feel like it's a little anemic go back in and, and correct it right you know and and you right. have some leeway to do that in watercolor it doesn't mean even though we always say you have less leeway than oil painter doesn't mean you have no ability to do that it That's just means right. you have to be careful with it because it's easily overdone and and um overworked so i just accidentally my brush hit into the beach and so i just kind of made it part of the messiness of the beach what happened there i did that all over my painting <laughs> everything was accidental just kidding my brush accidentally hit here so by doing that i think it definitely added a nice dimension to that this area that had i think was just a bit too flattened out mm -hmm. and it warmed it up too, so you warm that up. Yep. And yeah, I think that's very interesting. It shifted your point of interest a little bit, but I think, I think it's you just I think you come in at, these, at this red Absolutely. figure. Absolutely. And you come back down to these rocks. Right. You come, you down come back here. down through the that's now, right. How about your painting, Howard? How do you 
how do you see your composition? Well, I see coming. myself, and I hope my viewer will do the same, is to come in right in the third of the painting, go up towards the warmer place where that sun's trying to break through, and come right back down to this point, a little bit of a mark here, and back over to this warmness right. at the edge of the beach. Right. And I think that that will work that way. I think the hope is that the viewer's eye will do the same as mine. Right. And yeah, then, and just having that pop of, of uh, where you see the sun breaking through, just something like what Howard did there is enough to keep you in the painting and moving back down to this area, back down to the water, back down to the, the, uh, the beach. So sometimes Otherwise, just, that would have been an awfully large bit of area right. that has nothing happening in it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and in my sky, I have this warmer area up here where the sun That works wonderfully through. well. Yeah, I think that works beautifully. So this paint is already, I can't move this paint around anymore. Usually I put on a heavy application of paint so I can move it around and finish getting some of these edges and, and uh, doing what I want to do with them. But it's not doing that. And it's, uh, it's actually, actually firmed up an awful lot, which is... No, it's going to be it's going to be hard to, to cut in some of the edges if I need to clean them up a little bit. But it's just going to be what it is, and it just ends up being the painting that was done out here and done outside. And exactly, I'll just live with it as best I can. And I'm actually punching up these rocks here a little bit more. So now that I've darkened up this, this is one thing that happens. You change one area. <laughs> Absolutely. And it causes you to change another, but I think it's effective because I'm, I definitely see these, these rocks have really dark value here, and I don't want that to get lost. Um, and I think, I think it'll work well, and that'll also dry back too. Well, that's the thing, is you're always looking for, as a watercolorist, where it's going to end up being, where, right. it, where it ends up being the... You know, the final bit in the painting. So I think that was successful. I darkened these up quite a bit. And this is the point in your painting too when you're really looking to see is there anything that's distracting that is maybe brighter than you had intended? A few areas of rocks here that I think maybe got to be a little bit too bright. So if that happens with watercolor, you can go in with just a little bit of a little bit of water and just kind of dampen it down a bit. Um, if there's an area that you think got to be too much, right? Or you can add if there was a blue that got too much, you can add a little bit of a gray to it to calm it down. So you can do a bit of that adjustment. So I just adjusted a little bit on these rocks here, and I think it made a it. it, it made a significant difference in where your eye is going to go when you go back here. And I think that's better. I think that looks swell. So I dampened these down and I punched these up and to be a bit darker because uh -huh. they are pretty dark against the... Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's lovely. That was a good move. And that takes a lot of courage to do that because you're, if you're okay with the, what it looks like, Right. If you hate it, fine, you're going to take the chance. But if you're okay with what it looks like and you think it reads fairly well, right. but you want to just... You're taking a bit of a risk. Some, right, you're taking a big risk. Right. And that's good. I mean, do it. It's a painting. You can do another. Don't ever think that you shouldn't touch something because you're afraid of messing it up. That's not what it's all about. Right take that chance. So I'm stepping back now because now I'm at the point where I could over fiddle this painting. Oh, I think and I what I will often mine. do is I will take a photo of my painting and you can actually look at your photo in monochrome and it will help you see do your values work, right? So we often do that in class, right. Howard. That's correct. Where you can take a photo and you can actually look at it in monochrome. I can take a photo of Howard's too. And then it allows you to look and see, are your darks and lights working? Are they balanced, and whether they're pushing your objects back or bringing them forward right. without temperature. Temperature is the thing that'll fool you into thinking your value is correct. Right. You have to be very careful about that. And so, 
it, uh, we often, we usually won't do this when we're plein air painting. I'm doing it right now because I finish my painting so much more quickly than Howard. And so therefore I have some extra time. If this was a dueling demo, he would have lost already. Yeah, but it's not as but good we'll, a painting as mine, so that's okay. That makes up for it, right? It's hard to do this in the sun, but what you do is you just, on your phone, just look at it in monochrome. And um, you can, if you go to your edit setting and you do look at it in monochrome, it will allow you to really get a sense of how are the darks and lights working in your painting. I don't know if the, if the camera can see this at all, but when we look at it, Howard, you can see how those darks and lights are working on this. And I think they're working pretty well. My figures are standing out. Yes, they are. That's correct. So that even though, even there's not a color change, it's actually a value change to those. And, and it works very well. I, I can't see it. You can't see it? Okay. Now let's look. Oh, this is beautiful. I think you're done. I'm not going to touch it. So, what I see is just that hazy, silvery sky reflected in this water. These darks that really stand out backlit and then these beautiful warms that are just playing against that. And these warms cause this to just pop. Really successful painting. And those background trees really push back here, the nice gray beautiful gray that you got there. What colors did you use to mix that gray, Howard? Nice. Initially it was uh, the same as the sky using that uh, the viridian and uh, quinacridone red, but what I did was I warmed it up by adding orange to it and a bit of yellow to it, and that helped warm it up. And I went through that background several times. Right. So you'll see that it's, it started out much lighter, it got a little darker, I lightened it up again, I went back and forth until I right. found what I wanted and then was able to put these trees in front of it. Now you look at it as a totally different scene, but, but that's kind of the feel that I had when I first looked at it. Right. And that's what you have to stay with because it's your painting, it's not a, it's not a photographic reproduction of the scene. It's no, how it's what you it felt, felt like. That's exactly. right, that's right. And your water is just wonderful in how you got the sense of these ripples but you didn't do all your marks horizontal you have some some vertical and it really breaks that up and this, those reflections it just has a great feel to it of well that, not not that not haze. dissimilar to what you've done here where you have that that still water that lets these reflections be what they are they're lovely reflections multiple colors in them little water coming through like that some cools under here like wonderful warmth that you have that plays against those grays that are pushed back that sweep of the beach you did that with one mark lovely mark warmth here a few rocks that indicates rocks all over the place even the whites that you left are like reflections of the right. of the light hitting on wet on wet sand and wet rocks and then the the bit of that wall in your fingers it's a that's a wonderful painting I think. Very, very nice.